All right. So welcome everyone to episode 17 of the Edge Grip podcast. And with us today is world champion and an extremely accomplished racer and human being, Miguel Duhamel. Miguel, thank you for being with us today. Great yeah, to be thank here. You. Thanks for having me. Can you believe we're getting those type of guests? Uh, we are honored and humbled and uh, very, very lucky. Yeah. Especially being be nobody in the racing world. What are you talking about nobody? You're you're a 202 in Fontana, right? That's that's like record record pace. Yeah, it's too many. It's 20, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> And and Miguel actually lives ten minutes away from me, uh, so that's why we're doing it over the internet and not at my house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. could have drove, I guess, but uh, we're using uh, the, the, all the internet power. <laughs> the internet, Vegas actually it has it convenient. Vegas has better internet than than LA. So that, that's yeah, why. I'm sure it'll be a part two. Of this then maybe I can go to your house and do it there. Okay. <laughs> next, next to my Bimota. <laughs> Perfect. That that, uh, that bike. Every time you say Bimota, I always think of Anthony Gobert when they they hired him to race that thing, and he won in the rain. And that's that's what my head goes to, of course, you know, being a racer. <laughs> you know, I haven't oh, wow. ridden it. I haven't ridden it yet. It's been in my garage for two weeks, and I'm waiting for a DMV appointment. And DMV appointments, as you probably know, are like a month away. So there's still two yeah. weeks to like go there and register it. But you know, yeah. that's that's the well, government. The same thing happened with my NSX. I drove it up from Florida and they didn't have kilometers on it. So I had to go to DMV and and it turned into such a problem. I left my car parked for 10 years. Like I just drove it around the garage, started it once in a while. So it's got low mileage. And when I went to sell it on um bring a trailer, a lot of people are like, this is suspicious. There's no way a 97 car has got this low miles on it. You know, I'm like, well, you don't know a racer because I was almost never there. And when I was, I just started it. And it's a long story short. Anyway, I sold it. And uh, that was fun. I sold my two cars. I sold my Zanardi and I sold my uh, regular ASX. I was going to keep it, but uh, I got a nice uh, Mercedes SUV. And I love that. And running out of space, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. so I could do what the did. That was, that was good. Great cars. Yeah. The NSX is a collector car now. It probably doesn't oh, yeah. help that. Uh, uh, registration in in Nevada is like 600 700 bucks a year a lot of people don't know it they think that that's the state doesn't have any state income tax in it and mm -hmm. it doesn't but they can they get you on everything well, you do here yeah and that's why you see Montana place in Las Vegas you know and stuff like that you're like hmm that's a long sure. drive whatever yeah. I really <laughs> want to register it uh, yeah so yeah. so yeah, yeah you uh other taxes first of all thank you thank you for joining and you you started racing at the age of nine motocross yeah yep. uh and you had you had a formidable father that that's also a hall of famer yeah and Absolutely. was it ever an option or did, did you get like a motorcycle in your crib as as you know you were lying there at the age of three and there was a motorcycle you were hugging instead of yeah. teddy Basically, that's about it. My dad loved racing, and he he treated us all to a motorcycle very young. My brother had it when he was, I think, two and a half, three, and I got mine when I was three and a half. Rode around. There's many pictures of me on the bike, and I think he almost invented the training wheels. He went to the local Canadian Tire in Canada, which is like an Home Depot, and got little wheels and bolted on the bikes to make sure I'm when we first started and with the throttle and and he tied a rope to the bike. So when, you know, he would run behind us and tell us what to do. Not like you see a lot on, on Instagram and YouTube, people like, hey, got on the bike. Good luck. You know, and they wound up into a tree or something. So, um, yeah, we started with that. And then I remember like it was yesterday, we we're driving up to our uh, chalet and there was a race going on, with, but, you know, close to the highway. And until then, we, I just raced my sister and my brother and we had tons of fun doing that. Then we're like, we can race with all those other people. So that's how it kind of started at a very young age. And my mom and dad, they said, okay, we'll do a race. And I showed up on a Kawasaki 100. And it was, I think we took the lights off of it. It was, you know, not a motocross bike. My dad only put one shock because I weighed like 60 pounds and I couldn't even compress that. And uh, I don't remember, it was, it was funny. We just showed up and tried it and I spent too much time and money on it. My mom was praying that we would not like it, but unfortunately, yeah. Uh, we, we, my brother did really well, and I really liked it. I, I probably came in 
last or close to it, but I, I loved it. We had the film of that moment, occasion, moment, this occasion. And uh, it was fun. And from there, you know, here I am many years later and it all worked out. It's uh, when I look at racing and making money, motorcycle racing, I'm like, I should have picked a career being easier to make money and like maybe yodeling or <laughs> something, you know, like you look at the dedication took to all these racers, all the guys that did it to the top level. And some guys that got really close to the top level. I mean, the energy we put in there, if we put that in something else, that's probably a better paying job. We probably, you know, doing this from my flying blimp or something. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, it's, it's still great. And uh, it's a great uh, community to be part of. That's what, that's one big thing about racing as much as some people, you, I love the most people and I maybe didn't like a few, but it was still fun to show up and see all the, that same group, you know? So anyway, that's, that's about it from there. Yeah, motocross was fun. It's my first love. I still motocross to this day. I'll go out in, in Sandy Valley or I'll drive all the way up to California and or go up to Mesquite. You know, just past Mesquite in Arizona there. There's a couple of tracks and and I, I do enjoy riding motocross. You and still then, do the big jumps? Oh, yeah. No, there's not a – that used to be my specialty as a kid. And then my dad would encourage me. He goes, Miguel. If you can clear the same jumps that the 250s are clearing, this is back in the days of two stroke, 250, 125, 80 cc. And I was an ACC, I was a schoolboy. He goes, You'll get attention. You know, that's how you're going to put pressure on people. And I love sending it. I love doing back in those days, we had some quad jumps and doubles and triples and stuff. And man, it took all of my, my courage, but my dad goes, I know you can do it. So I, I, I always love doing that. And, and I keep doing it to, to this day. I mean, I've done some track days here in the Spring Mountain up in the Pahrump. It was mm -hmm. a great facility and great guys that put a, a thing together. And I asked Honda, they lent me a bike. It was, it was fantastic. And Kawasaki also, thank you very much. They lent me a motorcycle too. And, you know, it, it kind of puts a twinkle in your eye because you're like, wow, this is a little bit easier than what I used to do, you know, with the traction control and the automatic blip downshift. I'm like, wow, I'm doing half the work. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I can do this again, you know, and I just scream around there and I love riding with those guys and my buddies and just messing around with them. That was fun. But, uh, uh, you know, like, like I said, that's more, more of a, uh, that's more of a difficulty thing for me to do. You know, I'm kind of used to having somebody with my bike there, not me bringing my bike and my ridge line and, and doing all that stuff. And you need tire warmers, right. And all that stuff. So we're motocross. I just throw in a truck, go out there, start it, ride around. It's a Honda always starts. Even if I didn't start for a year and go motocross. And so I like to stay busy like that, but I also I do I play golf. So I call that exercise, but more like fresh air. <laughs> yeah. do, do you play golf with uh, Jason Pridmore? Uh, I have in the past when we used to race together. And I remember, I, this is a true story. I think it was like maybe 91 or 93. I went out to play. It was in, We're in Brainerd. There's a lot of beautiful golf courses were inexpensive. And and Jason showed me, like, you know, he gets on, gets on his knees and he's hitting the ball 250. He was, you know, trying to teach me a little bit. It's a shoulder turn, you know, throwing your arms. And I'm looking at him. And he's having a ball. Then we play golf and he, he, he just, you know, like all golfers, he complains, but he shoots like a 67 and he's like, Oh man, I can't putt or I did this wrong. And I'm like, and I am looking at him and I'm like, why are you racing motorcycles? <laughs> I mean, if I had your skill at golf, I'd be like hitting a million golf balls a day and, you know, making sure I don't hurt myself more than, you know, drinking too much cocktail before a game or something. But uh, I just, I remember that I was really trying to encourage him. Like you should really try that. You're actually really good at it. And, uh, you know, and as he explained, it's very difficult, obviously, but everything is. But I remember thinking when I saw him hit the ball and the way he played so good, I was like, why are you racing motorcycles? And unfortunately, that, that prediction came through twice. He qualified for the U.S. Open, and I think it was twice. He Obviously, he will tell you. But I know one time for sure he broke his lower leg, and he showed up with a, uh, the, the support thing to ring around the leg to stabilize his tibia. He actually played really well with that thing on his leg, almost made the cut to go to the to the main. And he made all the, the, the preliminary used to it. But anyway, yeah, so uh, not not recently. I mean, Jason's really busy doing what he's doing now, and I, I go out and play. Sometimes I'll play with Ben, though. You know, we enjoy going out. I enjoy playing with Ben. He's real busy with his kids and everything. He's a great dad. And uh, But when I can uh, twist his arm, we go out and play at my course at Bears Best, or we go – he sometimes let me sneak into the summit, which is the most exclusive uh, living area here in Vegas, which is, uh, it's nice to know Ben. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jason speaks very fondly with you with great respect because I've often taken his uh, courses and, and we're good friends and 
he used you as a as an example, but you can feel the respect in his voice when he talks about your racing. And sometimes he'll he'll say, "Well, Miguel used to do this and and teach students how to better ride." But there was always this intonation in his voice where it was always like a role model in terms of racing. That's awesome. Here's a funny little fact: we raced we raced at Pomona, California, and Jason and I were racing against each other. And Cal- uh, no, I was on Kawasaki, so it's ninety three, and. Um, it might have been Honda. Anyway, I was, we were racing in Pomona, and they had cones. The racetrack was made of cones, basically. Go around that cone, left cone. Not not the best thing in the world, but, you know, we're trying to get crowds to come out. Anyway, we're racing the race, and I clipped the cone with my knee. And the cone goes flying behind me. And we're like, you know, 600 racing. There was like seven of us racing for first place. Well, guess what? It flew off my knee into Jason's front wheel and crashed him. And after the race, I saw that he crashed, and I didn't know I hit the cone that hit him. And I was like, of all the guys, and we were best, we were pretty good buddies back then. I'm like, of all the like, seven guys behind me, my golf partner got freaking taken out by a cone that I accidentally hit with my knee. So, but he didn't hold it against me. He knew it was an accident. Funny, <laughs> I think. Uh, it's like a Mar- Marquez episode. He somehow keeps doing that to other racers. No, yeah, no, Mark is a little bit different. But uh, that's something something different. He's a great talent. I mean, this guy's and he's got iron iron guts too. You know, obviously we kind of all need that to to go through the things that we go through, and uh, definitely be interesting. I'm, I think everybody else. I can't wait for next season when he's uh, rides around with that Ducati. Isn't it funny though? Not that long ago, at least for me. You know, we're talking 20, 30 years. So I guess it is. I mean, you you wouldn't even dream of Ducati and GP being competitive in KTM. You know, it's like, are you kidding me? You know, I remember when McGrath tried to ride their motocross bike and they were like, ooh, this is not going to work. And and look where we are today, 223. And if you're not into Ducati or a KTM, you basically don't have a chance. The mighty Honda and Kawasaki, uh, Honda and Yamaha, thank God are still in there. I'd love to see Kawasaki back in there and, and Suzuki. But uh, isn't it crazy that we, we did that 180 on on uh, on racing? And never I would have thought that the Honda or Yamaha would be uh, pining to uh, – to compete against those guys but it makes them great racing that's for sure when you were when you were doing gp it was uh they also had the kajivas over there that were pretty yep. pretty good right yeah they had well they had one of the best riders on them i mean they had i mean they i think eddie was one that had brandy on it and did all the development i think they had kenny roberts to do some development like secretly and but by the time that eddie lawson got on it he, he pushed it forward and obviously won in budapest i was there it was a rain, half rain, half dry track, and he he called it perfect and uh, and smoked all of us. And uh, the one thing that was really surprising for me when I went to GP in '92 is how friendly everybody were. Um, Kevin Schwanz, Wayne Rainey, um, Eddie Lawson, and I'm mean, very approachable. I could just talk. I thought it would be like you know a bit of a elitist, a Heisman, you know, stay away from me kind of thing. But uh, they were, hey man, how you doing? And you know, we're just chit chatting. And I got you know almost goosebumps. Like wow, you know this. These are the guys that you're aspired to to get to and beat and try to race. And they were just, hey, man. And I, I love that. That really, uh, that was really nice. Wayne Gardner was the same. We, we were at, in the in Aspen when he got hurt pretty bad. He had a big crash. And he, his wife kept giving him beers and aspirin. And he looked at me and goes, I think she's trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was just hilarious, you know. And he gave me a tip. He goes, I think you need to be a bit more aggressive. I go, well, my bike is so bad. I have trouble feeling the bike. And. The next race, we went to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I stuffed him and passed him. He must have been like, "Well, he took my advice to really, you know, to heart." And it was one that was my best race of the year. And you know, the thing I like about Sao Paulo and Brazil is nobody knew the track, so um, we all started the same spot, and I was able to get a top five. And my deal with Yamaha France was a two-year deal. Obviously, I, we didn't look to fine print; it was optional in the second year. Because my point to that story is I wouldn't have let Wayne go. Uh, at Japan, I was I wasn't for a podium. I was running, I started dead last. And the only reason I qualified because it was rain one and was dry the other one. So I was 36 out of 38 riders on the last row. And in like four laps, I was fighting for the lead with Mick Dewan and John Kaczynski and Wayne Garden when he, he just fell in front of me and Wayne Rainey. And and I was just flying around those guys. And I that was my first race in GP. And I was thinking, like, we're gonna win this thing. And I was really comfortable and I was riding and I was well within, you know, it's not like I was pulling rabbits out of, you know, where. And when I fell after Dunlop curve, the little Degna, to this day, I'm still mad about it. 
because I don't know what happened. I actually leaned the bike in, and as I was picking it up, I, I the front end just locked up. I don't know if the brakes dragged or something. And John was kind of blocking me because I was trying to get by John to go get Nick and, and Doug Chandler to make sure I get a podium. So when that happened, you see me walking up. And I'm like, what the hell was that? Why did you know? But anyway, that was a great year. And I want to roll into this is also that that's the only track I knew, Suzuka. Then they go to France. They go to, the, uh, instead of going to Castel Le Mans, they go to Magnicor. I'm like, what the hell is that? And then when we go somewhere else, we go like, uh, we go anywhere I strike that we went where I had a, a career racing and I could do it. You know, I, I was looking for like to go to Le Mans, hopefully, or, or anywhere. They, they avoided those tracks that one year. Then they went, <laughs> now they go back to Le Mans. They're always, been, I'm like, why you know why um, so anyway so when we went to Paulo, he'll follow i think i could have stayed with wayne gardner i think i could have got him for fourth but because i didn't this bike was a bit unpredictable because the chassis was so bad and wayne rainey underlined that for the whole year he was so mad at yamaha and he was marlboro and that was you know the b rider and the or the c rider on the b team or whatever you want to call it uh, neil was a great guy neil mckenzie was my teammate very quiet but very nice and um at so Paulo, like i said i think i could have stayed with wayne and got fourth but since it wasn't the podium, I said, well, let's just get a top five. That's something. And, you know, that should make sure the next year we're going to come back and get more of these and probably some wins. And then next year they said, we're not paying you. And if you want to stay, we'll only race in Europe at the tracks that we have a spare bike for you. And I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like a hell of a deal. You know, worst sales pitch ever. So uh, I came <laughs> back to America because I was racing motorcycle to make money. I'm going to make a living. I wanted to be, uh, that's why you do it. You know, that's one of the reasons I, I did it. And, and uh, you know it all worked out. So, I think there's so, a lot of writers that are not getting paid these days, and and absolutely. they're making their money. Yeah, they're making their money off sponsorships. Yeah. So do, do you have I, any? You know, I can't. I can't. You know, you'll hear me complain because I'm a racer. We always complain about little things, and we tend to maybe focus sometimes too much on that. But I look back on my career, how from motocross, I was I was really hot, hot stuff in motocross, and I got, got lazy and I got my ass handed to me. When I got really to be good at motocross, I should have went to America. And raced against guys like Eric Hill was my age. And those were the big names of my, and I was like so full of confidence. It was a little bit nauseating. And, um, and I did it wrong and I got my ass kicked. And by the time I started getting back serious into it, I was getting older, it was harder. I got a big injury, but I was getting back into the podium in the, in the expert class, but the pay there, like you just said, there was nothing. If I, I kicked everybody's butt all year, you know, make 25, $30,000. I'm like, what's that? You know? Anyway, for the for the effort you're putting in, motocross is, you know, as you know, super training. So I learned from that. And uh, when I went to road racing, I didn't like it at first. I thought that was boring, no jumps, nothing. But uh, as I pushed it enough to where I could slide the tires, I'm like, okay, this is fun. And as soon as I start being successful in Canada, I'm like, first thing I did, I'm like, get me to the United States. Which leads to my, my point of my story is I'm so lucky that at my young age, I, right at that peak of my career, that AMA racing got serious. Because just a year or two before that, I mean, again, you couldn't make money racing in America. And then, boom, it started. And one thing leads to another, big sponsorship. And, man, and the racing was top caliber. One of the reasons why I didn't go to Europe is because, of well, if I can win in America, I think it'd be the same thing in Europe. Because, you know, when Scott went over there, he did it. And when... Um, John went over there, he did it, and the World Superbike, and Colin, when he went up, I'm not saying it was any easier, definitely not, it was, you know, at least as hard, maybe harder, I like those tracks, flowing tracks better than the tracks we have here, where it's a lot of stop and go, and the money was about the same, so I stayed in America, so. I, I think that's also, one my, that, that's one of my shorter answers to, did you ask me a question, or did I just go? <laughs> <laughs> you, you just went, but that's, that's, that's all right. When I, you have a I, career I, as rich as yours, that's, it flows. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, a factor of how much you get paid as a racer is uh, your star power and how many uh, butts you can put in the seats and how many people you can have buying your merch or or products you're endorsing. Mm -hmm. And you see it you see it with Formula One where it's um, it's less of the driving capa capabilities and more of the personality and how people can relate to you uh, and how big of a star you make yourself. So did, did you ever try to do that? Did you ever try to uh, be a, a, a more, I don't know, flamboyant personality, uh, stand out, uh, make, you know, make more fans? 
No, no, I never did. I, that's just the way I was. That's how I'm wired. So the other day I go play golf and people want to adopt me because I'm making laugh for 18 holes of golf and, and strangers, you know, and my buddies that, that know me, I mean, that gets to be a lot, but still, they, they, they still invite me to play. And uh, no, I was brought up by my, you know, by my parents, obviously, my mom and dad. My dad was very humble. I mean, here's a guy that was almost too humble. Nobody will ever match what my dad did. And it's not because it's my father. If I if I'd be one side to seven, I might be, you know, talking about somebody else that did what he did. I mean, that's just unbelievable. So snowmobile racing and everything. And he was my dad, so he got abuse. Sometimes I look back and back, I should have been more respectful of what he accomplished. But it's your dad, you know, he just. But anyway, um, no, my dad was like that. You know, he was very personal with everybody. He loved to have fun and talk and. And I always had time for fans, so we had no. I had no problem. That that's just something I rolled into, and I love doing it. I mean, why am I here? You know, people are. I I I would get away with some negativity. Who wants that in anybody's life? But it was so much fun talking to everybody, and and, and my 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 only. I don't regret might be a big word, but I wish I as much as I was accessible with my fans and everything. I thought I wish I would have been more. You know. Sometimes I was a little bit too focused on staying cool before race and hydrating and making sure I got everything right. Did I tell them about the brake fading? Only I can remember that. The adjuster's loose. And you go through everything. And so you're kind of doing that because there's a few times where I was signing autographs, especially when I first came on scene in 91, in 1990 and 91. I would sign autographs until the race would start. McCann would almost be like, you're going to miss the start, you know? And I'd be out there sweating and everything. I was younger, so I was, you know, but as I get older, you try not to make any mistakes because yeah, I'm the only one that knew that I made a mistake. I would go out and I, I forgot to tell him about the rebound. I forgot about telling him that. Then I'm suffering on a motorcycle. A motorcycle, the beauty is you can win on a bike that's a little inferior to what you need or want. You can still you know, manage that difference, especially in my days. But uh, but then you try to learn going, okay, I sit in the truck. Okay, I got to do this, that, 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 that. I don't want my tongue sticking to my palate because I forgot to hydrate before the race. So let's drink some water. Not too much because I want to be stuck. wanted to go to the bathroom while I'm running. You know? And yeah, it's funny. You see all us racers. We always ask for bathrooms so we could go right before. And anyway, no, I just, uh, in today's world, I mean, I, I'd like to think that might be dangerous because today, like you said, with social media and everything and the more into you, I think they would like me, but there's something I'm sure they wouldn't like. And, but it's, I, I always felt that it was a gift to have the, the fans show up as they did, and I was able to make that money it's because of them. If there was nobody there, then I could still do it, but with less money. And, no, it was fantastic. I was very blessed, like I said, to, to have my career projection go up at the same time as American Racing with involvement with the factories and involvement in the sponsorship, and we had decent TV coverage and everything. It could have always been better, of course. I always yell at AMA, let's stop making us dependent on factories and make enough prize money where, you know, even the fact there's a few guys, privateers I would see ride really well, but I go, they can't make it weekend to weekend. I mean, it's costing them too much money. Now, if they can make $10,000 for finishing seven or eight or five, 7,000 bucks, at least they can pay a guy. They can, you know, they can add parts and, and go to the next weekend and, 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 and actually not put himself in debt because as you know, racing is, you know, big debts for many guys. So, but anyway, right. uh, it's, no, I, I, I love being around the fans. That were, and I, I sometimes I like to do a, a a signing tour. Just go back, race, fill the grid, finish in the top ten or fifteen wherever I finish, and just spend most of my time just signing autograph and talking to people and and uh, say a proper goodbye. You know, my last my last tour around, but I I did it pretty well while I was there, so it's not it's not too bad. I don't I don't lose too much sleep over it. Yeah. So I, I have I, a two part question actually that because of what you just said, um, it. it in your generation, the, the racers had bigger personalities, very flamboyant, a uh, lot less restriction put on them on what they should or shouldn't say, maybe a, little, a lot less politically correct. Um, even in Formula One, right, you had Hunt and Lauda and, and the famous rivalries and, um, you know, fights that no team orders or, or contravening team orders. Then you had the big money from the cigarette companies when there was no restrictions from any type of product on, on, on sponsoring. So my two-part question is, do you think on one hand, the sport is better off because in essence, right now, everybody's such a good corporate citizen. You know, you, you go and, and at MotoGP, they're all extremely polite. They, they're careful about what they say. Everything is 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 uh, regimented and, and, and disciplined and uh, almost too sanitized. I mean, we sometimes we used to go to the after parties of MotoGP and these guys wouldn't want to take a picture taken with a drink in their hand because they don't think that's appropriate and they're sending the wrong message, although they're in a club partying. Um, 
and then at the same time, the sponsorship changed. So in your mind, Miguel, do you think that uh, the appeal of the motorcycle ra and racing in general, but motorcycle racing in particular, is smaller or bigger because of this change in in how kind of interesting, I guess, the, the, the racing is outside of the actual racing, but with the personalities? And then is it easier or harder today to get sponsorships? Um, because there's a lot of personal sponsors and team sponsors, but but you have less companies that can participate. Like cigarette companies can do it, alcohol companies can do it, and so on. So is is political correctness helping or hurting our sport? Um, that's a good question. You know, I think behaving in the right way though is very important for kids. I mean, there's kids watching us. They're growing up. They're on mini bikes. Mini bikes uh, boom. You know, and it's great to see little guys with the helmet bigger than their whole body riding those motorcycles and in motocross and in road race. So there, 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 there's got to be a balance of that. I think it's, I, I, I it's almost anything in, in small amounts is good. You know, you can always do it right. So I, I agree. It'd be maybe more fun, maybe to be a bit more flamboyant and, you know, do some things that we could do in the old days because there wasn't a 24-7 uh, camera on us and everybody judging you. And, you know, it's one thing to have uh, Paul Crudders that gives you his opinion because he's been around racing with his father also and, and he's been a journalist forever and say, I think this is this or that, that. And you're facing one guy, but it's another thing to have like a, a comment list of you know 20,000 people like, you know, just throwing whatever they think that you did wrong and being affected by that. So I think some of the people, the reaction is like, well, if I do nothing, then, then they can't comment on it. And it's, it makes my life easier because we do have a life beside racing. And, you know, we do have, a, we're emotional people. I mean, that's, so it's, 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 a, it's a complicated thing, but um, I, I, I think it's up to the rider and what you can get away with. I mean, our, our job is always to push it in racing and then also maybe push it when you can do interviews. Some people don't have that personality. I mean, I did a WWF Randy Macho Man style, uh, you know, interview with Larry Myers about Eric Bosch. I was going to put him out. And, and but that was good. That was that was entertaining. And the guys need to do that. I think I, if I would be part of that group, because I'm a bit out of that circus right now. But if I be in, I'm going, hey, man, you can be funny. You can do this, you know. No, no, no. And if you do something, well, you can always say sorry. I mean, I, okay, I, that was misinterpreted. I meant to be funny. Just trying to roll on the top of it, you know, be uh, I probably would get in trouble on every day <laughs> on a regular basis. But um, it's 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 something that, you know, they got to maneuver around, unfortunately. And, you know, you brought up the cigarette thing, and that just annoyed me to no end because they had, you, you know, endless money, Marlboro, uh, Rotman's, uh, New Lucky Strike. And they stop it because, well, it's bad influence for kids or whatever. Well, I'm a kid. I grew up in that business of racing, watching Marlboro, Yamaha, Rotman, watching all those guys racing and stuff. I don't smoke. Right. Patrick Carpentier, which is a very, very one of the best racers in car, IndyCar, when IndyCar was there, he, he was players. And he goes, you know what? I never once thought I, I wanted to smoke. I always thought I want to race, you know? And but the reason I'm complaining about it is like, like you just said, I mean, if that flow of money could be back in there, um, it'd be so much better for our sport, you know, it would help us be, we have much better racing formula one and everything. I mean, they're not struggling. We're still doing it, but it'd be so much easier. And I think it was a bit of a lie. You know, I think people smoke because they're stressed and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're freaking out about it. But um, I don't, like I said, for me, I look at Aaron Yates. I look at Anthony Gobert. I look at all the guys I raised, Ben Bostrom. None of us smoked. And we all grew up in that generation of the 70s, late 70s, 80s, uh, and so on and so forth, where that was what we were looking at. And you look at all the racers, and I mean, a few smoked. Michael Barnes, but he smoked before me. Mike was a lot older than me. <laughs> <laughs> the Mike was a great guy, you know, and, but, but you know, the, the list of race, I mean, even back in those days, Aldana and, and guys like that, the race, they would smoke, they would race and they were maybe not sponsored, but they were just smokers. Poking was more, more relevant. You could smoke in the plane back in those days, kids. And, right. Um, and, and I remember yeah, that, you know? Yeah. And, but still for me, I wanted to be a racer. So, uh, so sometimes that, that goes back to what you said, political correctness and this and that. I mean, I don't know. Even, even the racing, Pepsi money. Um, even the Pepsi um, money. Yeah. Is gone, right? Pepsi used to sponsor. Yeah, but they didn't even have the 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 link to stay in there. You know, that's the thing that happened in France. When he was Goldwise. Goldwise is a French cigarette company. And they said, well, we'll tell you Banco. Banco is like Canada. They have they own the lottery. 
So they made up the, the, the money that we're losing because they banned cigarettes because they said, well, McDonald's going to jump in and Microsoft and everything, which I don't know why they don't, especially a company like Microsoft or Apple, which have tons of money. And now bikes are so electronically based that, you know, you think that'd be something to be, but unfortunately it doesn't. I mean, the only people that like to play in that is uh, beers and cigarettes, you know, and unfortunately it's, we don't have funny. access to that money. Yeah. It's funny how regular cigarettes going away and then they made uh, weed legal. So yeah, it's I like, cycle well, all the where, time where's your logic? Here and, and well, I What's cycle it? all the time here and there's cars that go by me and you can smell it. It almost knocks you over on the bicycle. And I'm like, okay, I'm not allowed to have a beer in my car, which I understand that you know, nobody should be driving drunk ever, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that guy is having a good time and I'm hoping it's the passenger, but it could be the driver. And I hope he doesn't fall asleep and, you know, hit me like Larry Pegram got hit by a, a motorist not too long ago. I don't know if you heard about that. He got clipped while cycling, so and luckily he's okay. But he, he got banged up a bit. So, isn't he like a big? But yeah, no, it's funny. Grower? Isn't it weird? Isn't he like a big <laughs> weed grower? He has he has his own. Uh... Actually, he is. <laughs> it's funny that we run into that. <laughs> well, like if you say, if you do your things at home and everything, well, you're supposed to, and you're doing the controlled place, and it's okay. But my my problem with it is first of all, it stinks more than a cigarette. And if anybody smokes in my neighborhood, I'm like, who the hell's doing that? You know. Because it, it annoys me. My dad always had this really simple explanation about cigarettes, and it applies to pot. He goes, "When I drink my beer, I don't spit it back in you. You don't get to smell it. You don't get to taste it. I don't get to spray on you. When you take a puff of cigarette, if you could hold it in, you're good with me, you know. And then I can, but you blow it back out in my face, and it's all over the place. So there's there's a, there's a fine line to be walked there. But it is funny how they banned. They went really hard on cigarettes, and then. You know, they, they let now they legalize pot, which is not just smoke and annoying, but it's a, an an intoxicant game to, you know, it's like alcohol. Yeah. So. yeah. 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 You can't you can't walk on the strip five minutes without smelling it. And uh, I remember mm -hmm. I was before I before I moved to Vegas, uh, I was I was here uh accidentally for the first day where it became legal and, and I guess the state ran out of weed. Like the entire state just ran out in one day. <laughs> Everybody bought it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll it's tell funny, you, you know, there's, there's, there's another thing, another lesson for the kids out there. And I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for all these things sooner or later. But anyway, I mean, here's the, here's the when pot was illegal, uh, all the, the, the crime people were making tons of money, tons of money. The government takes it over and they can't have trouble making money with it. They legalize it and just showing how the government is not that efficient. Because I remember when you were here, like you said, and when they said we're legalizing it to help our schools and we're going to use that extra money to do this and that. And I'm like, oh, I don't see school. No, I don't see anybody going, yay, man, these are good. You know, that it's, uh, I don't know, but it's, uh, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah they use the money to exercise more control, but not to fix the infrastructure. That's right. <laughs> I mean, they have to rush and pay the, when, when COVID was around, I went cycling. I loved it because there was nobody on the streets or anything. I went, I was cycling. I did a couple of hundred mile rides, but bigger loops than usual. And I go on the strip, and I was riding on the strip, and I almost got flats because the strip was all messed up. And this is, you know, obviously it didn't happen because I was riding my bicycle. It was messed up before COVID started. And I'm like, how can one of the most rich, famous street be this bad? And you saw they had to like pave it till almost the last day for Formula One. And again, it goes back to what? Why are you doing with our money? I mean, I'm I don't mind if in summer there's a few bad roads. I mean, you know, with the heat and everything, they'll fix it sooner or later but the strip for me i mean it's a sense of pride i mean people, people come here to spend a lot of money and have a lot of fun give them a nice street to drive on you know yeah anyway that we're we're getting are we still talking about racing <laughs> yeah let's, let's, let's talk about racing Let, let's talk about 1987 you rode an rz350 and an fz750 uh, in uh eastern canada uh, and that was the yep. year before yep. you started racing professionally in 1988. So how was how was riding the that legendary RZ350? That was such a fantastic chassis motorcycle. Great two-stroke. I mean, I love that bike. I mean, I could just rail through corners. And, you know, the one thing I didn't do when now that we're talking about is I'm talking two-stroke. When my career took off in Canada, I came to America. Maybe I should have done the same thing that I did with Canada America. I should have went to Europe to go GP because... I used to be a two-stroke specialist. I hated four-stroke. You know, back then they didn't have the slipper clutch. You go to downshift, the wheel would start hopping off the ground, and you had to do the clutch thing. And and it really inter it really set me back as far as corner speed because with the 350, I would race superbike against superbikes. And we found out that even though my lap times were faster than the superbikes, 
they're in the corner same time as you. So even if you go around them a bit, they then they ought to accelerate you and then break and stop you in the corner, which led to a lot of mayhems and fights almost. But uh, I love that 350. Oh man, I had so much fun. And back then, they, Honda they were my enemy because they came out with the NSR 400 and they allowed them to race. So the class now was 400. These guys would blow by me pretty good in the straight. Shannonville had a long straight. That's where I used to race in San Air in Quebec and and I'm, but I'd still beat them. And they always thought I was cheating because they're like, well, how can this bike do that? I'm like, dude, I went around you on the brakes and then I left you in the next corner. I mean, what did that have to do? I mean, we rode tires. We we're on the strict budget. And I remember when I rode the Bedzeller ME1s and we would ride those things till the cores almost showed up. And I wasn't even thinking like, you know, maybe if I get rid of all these like cuts, it'll be a slick. That doesn't work. They don't turn into slick. They turn into slippery you know i was almost crashing everywhere but i could save that thing slide it you know even though i didn't have that much power like through four to carousel shannonville on my knee like dirt tracking it through there it was just so much fun and the 750 was a pain in my you know what it wasn't that competitive we didn't couldn't find a steering dampener for it so we took one from the bmw but it didn't really have enough power so it was it would really head shake a lot and just to give you an idea how fat she star i was then my mechanic at the time goes, let's bend the shaft. So that'll create some more uh, stiction. So maybe that would be a better steering dampener. That didn't work. It led to one of my biggest crash. Back then I was racing with motocross gloves, no back protector. And going down to Moss Corner, Mossport, beautiful track, fantastic track. Going left, the bike kept wobbling. And every time the steering dampener got hot, I couldn't drive it. And then I couldn't ride it. But when it got cool, I could go and I could pass a bunch of guys. But then I would like, you know, almost die. And then one day I thought, you know, maybe I can save it. So I crashed and literally destroyed the motorcycle, which wasn't mine, was lent to me. Just de destroyed that thing. My gloves went flying off, broke my back, broke my vertebrae in my bottom of my back. And the bike, like, it was such a big, fast crash. It took like an hour to find the motorcycle. It was in the woods, gone, destroyed. <laughs> and we put it back together to give the guy. It would have been cheaper to actually buy a new one and put it back to the parts we did. But the 750, I didn't like that much. It didn't didn't do it to me, but the 350, that was great, man. Then I, you know, then I, I raced the 250 for John Lassick, and I set some track records here, and I saw a track record in Shannonville, but I think they just got tired of seeing it, so they they, they gave it to somebody else, but I, you know, I, I was, uh, I, I love 250s and uh, two strokes, and uh, man, I, I just, I, I, going back, and it brings back a lot of good memories of uh, my corner speed and, and everything. I could get away with those bikes. And then 1988 rolls around, you be begin your professional career, um, 1988 winning top rookie of the year uh, on board the Monty Sport Kawasaki's backed by Pepsi. Yeah. How, well, how, did, that, we, how did that Pepsi Kawasaki deal work? Well, and Pepsi, we know this guy was trying to help me. He was a friend of ours. And we had this big bottle of Pepsi and everything. And the only thing we got is like free, all the Pepsi we can drink, you know? So uh, we didn't really get any, I think maybe got a thousand bucks and which was appreciated, but then it didn't pay for the season, you know, pay for a weekend. And we hauled the big bottle around. It was just a, we were hoping we did that. So the next year they would come in with bigger money and, and something right more, but you know, that, that didn't happen. Uh, you, you never got the hair. That was hockey. I mean, that, that bike was like three years old, two or three years old, been modified a few times by the previous owner, both uh, mechanically and uh, throwing over the fence. And uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it, it handled good. You give me a good handling bike. I can run with anybody. And uh, that's what I was able to do with that bike. And the Ninja 750 and my 600 was pretty slow, but I, it all handled good, and I was very competitive that year. Um, to this day, I'm still mad at Gary Goodfellow because I think I should have won in Vancouver. You know, he got the start in the back, but if you look at the start, he jumped the start. Should have been black flag. <laughs> but I got to finish on the podium there, and that was my first podium, and the next race was in the rain. Uh, let, let, it go, let, huh? let it go. Just breathe. Let it go. Just breathe. Breathe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was yesterday. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, but, but he did jump the start. Um, no, but you know, and then Gary's a good guy. I mean, uh, he's, he was a very talented racer. I mean, he did good for Canada. He, he, he pushed and raced around the world like Michelle Mercier did and everything. Well, good bunch of guys. Again, the racing in Canada was very strong, very stout, which made me a better racer. You know, some people think, oh, let's lower it down to, you know, and have somebody else have a chance. Well, I'm not going to have a chance when he gets with the real guys. So I, 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 I hit the hardest in America and Canada and hit the hardest in America when I started racing. And, 
listen to this. We go to we go back to uh, to Canada. We hit a moose, by the way, driving back from home. Just crawled out in the middle of the darkness, hit a moose, and um, we fixed the motorhome. And we told the guy we want to keep the leg and some meat of it. <laughs> we might as well keep it, you know, not, That's not, not waste it. And they were by the Lake Erie, so somebody on the lake played through a bunch of hunters that showed up, and they helped us with that. And then we picked up the meat, we took it to Montreal, and we ate it. It was delicious. But then our bike, we took the head off the super bike, and we look at the piston, and there's little there's little marks on the piston. We're like, what the hell's that? And then we turn over, and the guides for the for the valves were breaking off. I guess with the vibrator, there was a problem. There's a five guide, and, and they're breaking. So with our limitless budget and factory racing we were, what we did is we took the head, put it on a uh, in the spinning thing, and we just we just cut them all down. The guides, no more guides. We don't need those things. They're, they're messing up the piston. And put the engine back on, started it. Norm Murphy was a racer. He was more factory than I was. When he saw us do that, he was scratching his head. Bike started. And that weekend, I won. I uh, beat Michelle Mercy in the rain and uh, my first super bike win. You know, you know those guys are there for a reason. <laughs> we didn't yeah, we no figure out what it was. We're not, that was above our pay grade. We're like, you know, they're just breaking off. Might as, they look like crap. Might as well just like mill them down so they didn't stop breaking. And that, that's that's how we, we went about racing. I mean, uh, I remember that year in Calgary, I was talking to Steve Dick, another good racer, and we're buddies. And, man, he just – I just got beside him, and he let go of the brakes, and he just closed the door. I mean, I crashed, and luckily nobody hit me, and I just I was so mad at him. I was like, why did you do that? First corner. I mean, that's 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 the thing that you do to, for the win. This is the first corner of a 20-lap race. What are you trying to do to me? Anyway, uh, we worked hard on that. My dad did a lot of work. He was a pretty good mechanic, you know, and for some reason the disc brakes were not fitting again. We had to grind those things down. I kept thinking, man, the brakes are going to fail. I'm going to die. But uh, I don't know, all good times and all worked out. <laughs> I, I got I got a question for you, but I don't want I don't mean to get you all rotted up uh, more than you are. So you won mm -hmm. Daytona five times. Scott Russell won Daytona five times. Why did he get the nickname Mr. Day Daytona? No, uh, no, I don't know. I mean, Scott's American guy, you know, I, I'm as American as apple pie. And uh, as far as like, I, I you know, I, I didn't come to America to change it. But I understand that, you know, Scott, Scott's a great guy. Um, I won it before he did, I think. No, did he win it before me with Suzuki? Anyway, yeah, we're all tied and I won way. I mean, Scott, Scott's a, like I said, Scott's a great guy. We weren't the best close buddies, but we were good buddies. I mean, if we'd see each other, we'd have a drink together. No problem. And I remember one time somebody told him, ah, oh, Mr. Daytona, and he, and he just looked at the guy, goes, Miguel won a lot more than I did. Because, you know, I won 600, so many. I think I won like 12 times in Daytona, five superbike and the rest 600s. And I, I even raced there in motocross. In the, uh, the C-Class, 125, when my dad raced in 86, I got a top five. I got a big trophy. It's right there that I got. And I, I, I finished in the top five, raced the legendary supercross track at Daytona. That bike had no power, which was kind of great because, you know, it's sand. I was just wide open the whole time. And somebody just sent me a couple of pictures. I tried to jump over this guy one time because I was just trying to get in front of him. But, uh, uh, that, you know, that was that was, that was was a good time. But, yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, this is, that's how it is. You know, I, you don't get to pick those things, you know. You want a cool nickname, but uh, he, he got it. So that's all right. What's a cool nickname for you? We got to oh, think about it. We I'm pretty think. modest. You can call me legend or, uh, okay. you know, something <laughs> like that. Something, I mean, God's pushing a little bit because blasphemy, but you know, something, something around those, those little, you know, low levels would be nice. <laughs> no, I just, I'm just happy to be me, man. I just, uh, you know, uh, Harley Davidson, uh, they said, well, let's just, because is it Duhamel? Is it Duhamel? And I'm like, well, both pronunciation and French sound about the same. So I'm like, whatever you guys want. And one guy at Harley, let's just call you Hammer. I'm like, I like that. I'm like, call me the Hammer. That's cool. So we're, for a little while, that was the Hammer with Harley. But uh, that's that's how it rolls. You don't pick those things. You, you I know want... I want to be called. A lot of people call me Mig. Like, I like that. It's my abbreviation, Miguel Mig. But then I'm like, you know, I'm in America. I don't want nobody to think I'm a Russian sympathizer with the Mig airplane. <laughs> so I'm like, I am going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to squash that right away, you know. That's what I, that's what I was thinking. I was always thinking. Sometimes I overthink things. Yeah, Mig Hammer would sound a lot like a NATO designation for a Russian plane. Yeah, again, see, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, comrade. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Oh. Yeah. 
Um, you won with every variation of the RC 30, 45, 51. Uh, how how was the, the progression of the machinery in, in Honda? Because Honda is not known or at least was not known for uh, taking big steps. And, and in those years, those were giant steps. Uh, so every time you got the new, the new bike, did you go like, Oh, you guys did good. Or, or how was, how was the progression? No, it's a good question. You know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot in there. I'm going to try to keep it more brief. So, but um, I'm not going to succeed, but I just want you to, I'm trying. Um, but when I went from Harley Davidson in 94 to 95, I went to Honda, which was very, very good for me because it was a bidding war to get my services. Same thing in 94 at Harley won in 95 Honda won. And Kevin McGee was developing the RC45. Or, yeah, that was the RC45 then. And I went first time I rode was in Daytona. And that bike tried to kill me. I mean, I came in, I went out and I did like five laps. And I came in and the, I remember my Honda team, they're all like, how great is this bike? And I'm like, not really. I go, this is horrible. And they're laughing. I'm like, no, no, I don't like to make jokes. But so I, I would like, I don't remember like it was today. And, and it kind of led to me not getting a job with, with uh, Merlin Plumley, which is really sad. I really want to work with Merlin. My girlfriend's going to work. <laughs> I really wanted to work with uh, Merlin Plumley because he was so great. He was a fantastic man and great mechanic. But here's why he didn't want to work with me. So I go out, I come back. I said, this is really bad. And they go, let's try one click and rebound. Let's try one click and reverse compression. And every time I went out, it was a miracle. I came back not killing myself, not crashing. I mean, I was losing the front in the banking. I mean, losing like, oh, my God. I'm just, you know, and your heart just stopped. And I was like, this is no, this is unacceptable. I mean, we're literally, I mean, it's banking, but it's basically going in a straight line. You know, I mean, they should be able to do that. So after three times of coming in and trying to explain to my mechanic that we need a surgery, like I don't need a click in their freaking blah, blah, blah. I need a new front end. I mean, we're talking maybe even a chassis. This thing is horrible. What are you not understanding? So, you know, I start stalking like that like with my eyes. I'm like, you got to do this. I'm not going to write this thing. It's the theft machine. So, they're, oh, 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 and Merlin heard that. And it threw him off. He didn't like a writer talking about that as a mechanic. But like I told him, we have, you know, I've known Merlin forever. May he rest in peace now. But I used to say, you know, I did that to, to shock them to, to do something because they almost were like, let's change the sticker. You think the sticker would be nicer? You'd like the sticker on the, the ferry? You think that's going to help? And I was like, no, no. Take this thing, put it in the crusher, tell Japan to send us a new one, you know? Uh, but uh, from there, you know, it was a hard struggle. I mean, I'm telling you, the bike was horrible. And then we we made it work, obviously, and won everything that year. Um, and what really spiked me that year was me, my my teammate Mike Hill. Yeah. All, all my teammates were great. Mike was a great teammate, and he was a great racer. And we're racing, and he's having more success than I am. I had a couple of bad luck. I hit Jimmy James rear fender, my front brake at Pomona crash, and when I try to pick up the bike, I rip up the air ducts. Anyway, I just so my first few races were not that good with that bike crash to Daytona. And um, from about 600, I was doing pretty good. And me and Mike were fighting it out, you know, smoking Joes. And then the Laguna Seca was with a turning point for me. I, I, I do a good race in Superbike. And in the 600 race, me and Mike are going at it. I mean, just, we're gone. We're just, you know, we're, we left everybody. And I'm going last corner, going 11. I'm like coming out of 10. I'm like, I'm setting him up a bit. I go, if he makes it kind of easy, if he, he gets lazy on the break, I'm going to pass him. But if not, he's my teammate. And I like him. I mean, if he wasn't my teammate, was Kawasaki somebody else, I probably ran it in there. I'm like, well, you know, tough break, kid. And, you know, see you later. But I'm like, that's Mike. I go, if he wins, and I, I finish second, one, two. I mean, we, we got the first two step at the podium. Next race, I'll win, and he'll get second. So he, uh, you know, I, I, I go to throw it in there, and I said, well, if I do, I might pump it off the track, and I don't want to do that. So so I step behind, he wins, I get second. I run celebrate. I come in pit lane. My entire team and this team are celebrating like he just won the world championship or just like like an Armageddon, like got rid of the meter, was destroyed the planet. And I'm holding my bike going like, can somebody put a stand on this thing? <laughs> I mean, what the, did he just win the world championship? This is like the third race in the season or fourth race. And I'm being like, like stiff arm Heisman again, like go away. I don't know which way is it is. And uh, finally to put the stand on my bike, I get out the bike and now I am fuming. I mean, I am just like, I can't believe that's just not right. We're a team. Why am I being this? And this is the only time I think my dad shows up in the team 
bus. As I'm getting undressed, and he goes there to console me. He goes, Miguel, you had a good race, and uh, you did good, kid. You know, just keep it up. And he was always very positive, my dad. And I just went, F this. That's never happening again. Not that I, and then I just blurred out and with more explicit what I just told you guys. And I'm like, no, not winning again. That's, you know, and I was just like fuming, veins popping. And my dad went, okay, all right, good meeting. And he walks out. And from that on, I won six in a row on Superbike and I won 13 in a row on the 600. So the motor of the stories don't get me mad. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but, and uh, again, Mike had a great career and he was a great teammate and uh, we had fun, but that, that really lit the fire underneath me. And, and went through the development, the RC 45, the best RC 45 was 1998, 1999. Uh, the development there was terrific. I used to use springs that would, the, the Japanese say, you can't use these springs they are too hard. I'm like, I'm using them. And they wouldn't believe it because, but I set it up so I could break super deep. And that's why I was competitive in the world superbike. Me and John Kuczynski would go at it. I sure wish we had the same tire rule that we have today back then, but we didn't. He had Michelin that I had done unlock. But we, we, you know, we, we did some some really good work with that. And unfortunately, the problem with Honda is after they get bored after four or five years, like okay, let's do something else. And I'm like, no, this is perfect. I can win with this every day, you know. But uh, it was the way it was. And on a side note with John Kuzinski, when I was in the World Superbike, I was leading the race. I passed him. I wanted to lead, lead at least five or ten laps, which when, when my tires started going down and I knew he was going to walk away from me. Um, I went through turn six. I turned turn five and turn six up under the bridge, the left hand going up to the corkscrew. And I had the line there. It's just, again, with my bike set up, I go in the brakes so deep, get the bike sideways sliding over there at just get back on and dirt track it all the way up the hill. Just a little bit of power drift all the way to the painting line. I pull like half a second, three tenths of a second, which is a lot in one section on John. So at the end of the race, I'm on the podium. John won. We're, we're in the same truck waving, you know, go around. You wave at the crowd. Hey. And we're going around. Wave, wave, wave. John's not a big talker. Not to me anyway. We get to turn six. And he just looks at me, grabs me by the shoulder, goes, you were really fast through here. And then he just starts waving again. <laughs> and I just start waving. And it was like one of the best companies ever received. Here's a competitor that's one of the best friends in the world, world champion. I mean, John Kaczynski, everybody knows that guy. But for him to like take my attention and say, hey, you were so fast through her, it was impressive. And then he just started waving again. And, and we never talked about it again. But for me, it stuck forever. There's, there's little things like that that you got to cherish. And that, that's one, one more that I really like. RC45 was my favorite bike. The RC30 was good, a little too stiff on the front. Hard to turn, but I did like the RC30. Raised the 24 hours with it. RC45, like I said, the last two years, I broke my femur, bad luck. And I have even won, you know, I don't need race, like four races. And I won two or three or four of them, and then I got hurt. So you can see that I'm saying it's true. And uh, if I didn't get hurt, I'm doing bad luck, I would have won a lot more. The RC51, I didn't like it as much as Nikki. Nikki was great on it. Turned out that the, we didn't have the idle high enough. So I couldn't carry any corner speed. Every time I shot up, it got so much compression. And the day we discovered that, I went like from being almost a second down to being as fast as anybody and then start winning with it. The idle. Yes, people. Ah. No brakes, no special jet, no special tires, anything like that. Just turned the idle up. So when I shut off and the, the transition, the bike would roll a bit better. Boom. We start winning with that bike. Well, it was a solid bike, but it wasn't my favorite. Then the CBR that, 1000 came out and that thing was a spaceship as far as speed. Did it have a slipper clutch? The, the RC51? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but we couldn't get it. We couldn't adjust it right. I just we tried and tried and tried, and we just couldn't get it right. And I just with the the gearing that I wanted, with the way the slipper clutch had to be, I just couldn't get it to work. And it was as simple as that. It might have been Merlin Plumley that you know slipped the lip or something, and and we we're here to talk. And, and the bike went from just that little difference, boom. And with this, that the day we discovered that was at Sears Point, and I went from like six five. Second to Nike or something like that, and and then we were off to the races, literally. Nice, yeah, yeah. The one thousand, I was gonna say the one thousand. You had you had the sheer bad luck of of going up in in that bike against uh, the Suzuki's, right? No, the thousand CBR. The first thing about it, I loved it was a thousand. And 750s were cool. You could do 190 with the bike, you know, and top speed. This 1,000 was doing like 200. And from 190 to 200 is only 10 miles an hour, but it's like it's like 90 miles an hour faster. It's hard to explain. The, the gaps of speed and your brain processing power, is it's quite a lot. 
I remember like when I threw that thing out of the chicane in the banking coming out three and four, and I always I had a light that I would look at, come out, get on the throttle, look, look for my light, and start bringing it down and trying to miss all those cracks back then that the banking was all messed up. You didn't want to hit that tar because it really upset the bikes. You can't tell on TV, but trust me, it did. And I come out of the chicane, I'm more up, more up, and that thing just I'm like, was that the light? Did I just miss my, my I mean, it was like, I felt like Captain Kirk in Star Trek when he goes, warp speed. And I just called like that to my bike. I'm like, oh my God, this thing is fast. And we had great success with that bike. It was pretty good. But then, yeah, as you touched on, the Suzuki's bikes start making funny noises. Uh, and this, you know what? It, you won't hear me complain about any loss. But I, like I'm, I, I, I was mad at Mike Hill. Not Mike Hill. I was mad at my team for the way they disrespected me when I got second. But I wasn't mad at Mike. And like I said, I didn't stuff him because I, I didn't mind him winning. And I only do that for my teammates and maybe some friends like if Larry Pegram's there or something. You know, I, I, there's some guys that you, you you give a bit more margin, you know, and then some of the guys are like, you know, good luck for you. But um, uh, but the um, I, and, and I, I don't mind getting beat. I don't like it. And that's what made me who I was and who I did, what I, who I am. But um, that that was just a bad, bad timing because racing started going down. Money started going softer. To, sure, for a little while, people were like, yeah, he's winning everything. Suzuki's winning everything. And, then, and But then I'm like, what that kind of racing is that? Who wants to show up and see that? And if you look at it, you can you can make a chart where, you know, it's, racing went down, people turning up went down, money went down. And then we had the 2008 economy crash where it's that – that's really the reason why I was surprised by my retirement because I didn't want to. <laughs> but Honda says, we're not going racing anymore. We're done. And I told myself, I'll race for like a tenth, a tenth of what you paid me. Just keep my bike. I want to keep going. I want to see if I can, you know, turn this thing around. And they're like, no, Miguel, we just, we're printing on both sides of white paper. That's how much we're suffering in money. We can't, you know, we can't afford it. But they had to do with Neil because Neil had another year in his contract. So they, they that's why they weren't racing that one more year. But anyway, I mean, I saw him at the, it started all at the Barbara. I remember like it was yesterday. It's an open test. We're testing there and they were leaving Morse code. I called it rear slide, like slide a little, a little break of, of pure asphalt, slide, pure asphalt, slide. I'm like, nobody can do that. There's, unless you're chattering, but it was not, you could see because that, that big right-hander and um, I'm going to see, I'm not going to cry, but um <laughs> You know, I could see, and you could hear back then, you know, if you guys know, you look at YouTube, it's still up there. The bike goes, bop, 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 and I'm like, what the hell's that? And and they went from being like, not a really big concern of ours to being like unbeatable. And, you know, you know the, the, I'm thankful that Ben Spees came along and, you know, set the record straight. Ben Spees is a real, true, natural talent and went on to do a terrific career. He's such a great guy. And unfortunately, he got hurt with his shoulder and everything, but I, I liked him winning better than, than the other guy, but... Because the other guy, you know, they were just, they were being cocky about it. And they knew they couldn't get caught. Now, for everybody listening to me, listen clearly and carefully. You're not allowed to have traction control in AMA. That was always been the, 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 the rule. And you're not allowed to run a front wheel sensor. Now, why do I say that? Because AMA thought that the only way you could do traction control or power control, whatever you want to call it, is through the front wheel. The front wheel doesn't slip. So if the rear wheel is going faster than the front wheel, very simple to make traction control. So that's why they bang any sensors on the front wheel whatsoever. But they figured out a way to do it with GPS and mappings and, and Amar Bazaar, the guy was a genius with computers and, and they kept with it and they, they, they came up with a, an idea how to do it. And more importantly, they, the AMA couldn't prove they were doing it. I, I, they just took too long to let everybody do it. And by the time they did, again, back to the economy crash, I mean, we knew the Mitsubishi system that they were using was the number one. It was using GP with lean bank sensor sensors and everything. And me being with the guy that I am in racing for so long, a lot of guys came up to me and said, this is what they're doing, Miguel. I know. I saw it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm allowed to go over there. I looked at it. And I would tell the MA, they're like, oh, well, we just can't prove it. We don't know how to, you know, to do it. So, And they lost two big fights against Roger Edmondson and somebody else. They got sued. And I think they were a little gun shy to getting sued by Suzuki because Suzuki said, if he can't prove it, that's slander towards our writer and our team. So they just went like this and, you know, one, two, three Suzuki. 
and it was bad for the show. You know, I, mean, I thought, yeah, I thought, I thought too when I was, I was on a K six on a Suzuki K six in in WSMC, and there were some of the guys that were running, running the K seven and the K seven. You could you could clearly see it in Willow turn four. A and B, you could see the bike just goes like this and brings itself back. And okay. and as soon as I saw it, I was like, and I you could hear the engine cut off. Um, and back back then it was you know it was very rudimentary, but it was still the bizarre. And system. it was easy to point out, like you're saying, like when I pointed yeah. it out the first time, everybody knew, like, what's going on, you know? And everyone knew. And I said to them right there that day, as it went along, then you could tell at the end. There's no way you could tell. You know, and then by then they stopped making the, the gas cutting and the backfires and all that stuff. And the bike, which is like today's bike, you don't hear MotoGP bike doing that. Yeah. And so they got it together and they got it going, but it, it just killed the sport. And Matt Maladin was racing for 10 years in America on good team, Fazbear Faraci. He had one win in 10 years. Same bike that Goldberg used to win a lot. And Doug Chandler won a lot on it. A lot of guys won a lot on it. Ben did a great job on that bike. He had one win. And then when Suzuki's bike started doing rat noise, he got 60 wins almost in a row. So, I mean, come on. I mean, it doesn't you know, take a you know, you know what happened? Control. You know what happened once they got caught? They said, oh, traction control doesn't help with the lap times. It helps managing the tire uh, during the race. Yeah. The tire goes away. It keeps the tire uh, from, from sliding. Uh, so mm -hmm. they're trying to play it down like it doesn't really help. Man, I talked to journalists. And they would tell me that story. They would be like, oh, you know, it's power control or it's for the tar and everything. I'm like, I don't care if it's for better grades in school. It's not legal. And don't you see there's only three guys winning on that bike? It killed Kawasaki. It killed if Honda. And they couldn't afford If Honda couldn't do it, then Kawasaki sure couldn't do it. And Yamaha, they, they didn't want to do it until it was legal. And when they did it, they did great. And, you know, a lot of guys won on that bike. But it just, it was just so frustrating because it's 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 kind of having you know oh, should i go there or not well what the hell let's go it's like uh, having a guy competing against girls you know i mean like yeah you're a top 10 and guys but now you're kicking all the girls but you i don't care if you think you're a girl you, you can't do that compare you can be a girl if you want to but you can't compete against them because it's not fair so i went there so but, so, uh, so uh, the, fact, just, the fact that you went there racing bad the fact that and you went there, so right? Bad. That was one yeah. thing, and I didn't have a chance of winning. Neil didn't have a chance of winning. Nobody had a chance of winning unless they all broke down, and they never did. You know, I always hope, I pray, I really do pray that one day somebody that was involved in that will come out and write a book or just come out and say, yes, this is what we did. I feel bad about it. I'm a pure racer, like maybe a Don Sakakura, somebody that's been in racing forever. That, that I mean, and he's an artist. He's an artist. I'm, I'm not saying he knew. I'm not saying he knew. But let's say I'm using his name because I know him. You know, I'm a, I don't think. But the, but Don Don is an artist racer. The man is a motorcycle through and through. You the guy when he cut himself, he would bleed oil. I mean, the, the guy is and he is he's, he's a craftsman of what he did with Yoshimura, big part of your success. But if somebody like him or somebody else would know, and they'd be like, you know what, I, I need to get off my chest. This is something that we did. You know what? That'd be nice because I. I am 100% convinced that that's exactly what happened. And my only consolation is when Ben Smith came around and started winning everything. And, uh, you know, because Ben was a good rider, a great rider, and it was fun to see him do that. We, we had him on a podcast, by the way. Ben. You did? Yeah, we had yep. him on a podcast. Yeah. All right, I'll so, look it up. Yeah. I, I have a question for you. It's it's a little messed up question, right? Um, but since he went there, why, why the hell not? Uh, so Josh, <laughs> Josh Hayes, all right. I'm, I'm just taking the gloves off cause you know, nothing over here is according to plan. Uh, Josh Hayes broke your all time AMA record. Now I have a way for you. It's a cheater way, but it's a way for you to get that record back. What if I'm you listening. go to, okay. <laughs> all right. What if, what if you go, what if you go, there's way more classes today, uh, than there were, uh, when you were, when you were racing there. Uh, so why don't you uh, why don't you go to Moto America and tell them you identify as a woman and and enter the Royal Enfield, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, Royal, exactly. the Royal Enfield ra races, and that way yeah. you can get your record back. I don't know if I could pull it off. I'm just don't know. You need to get hair extension. Um, 
Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think I need to do that. I think I could probably go there and beat those guys. I mean, the class that Josh won in there. I mean, Josh raced against us, and he's a good racer. He's a top racer. He's got eighty-seven wins. That's amazing. But I, I can't fault him for for keep racing and doing it the way he did it. And you know, I mean, they, obviously there are different times and there's different things. Uh, but it's you know, you know, hats off to him that for doing it. I mean, here's a guy that did it by himself and got to be a factory rider. So when you know, he got a little bit less help. He still could do it. I never did it that way. I mean, my dad helped me a lot. And right away, I became a factual rider. So for me to grab a bike, put in a trailer and go race, it's not going to happen. I don't, I'll just show up with mirrors and go, oh, that's not legal. I didn't know. I don't remember, you know. But uh, no, he, he he did, you know, he did good. And Josh is a good guy. I mean, he's a good guy. So I wish he hadn't been broken it. But, uh, you know, it was done in different time, different circumstances. And it is what it is. It's I wish the, you would stop at 86. A tie wasn't good enough for you, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the, the way the way he does it too is um he's a racer through and through, and and the guy, the guy's yeah. just an animal, just an animal. And the fact that he did it on an R6 uh against the Ducati, which is basically a leader bike, it's it's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, he's yeah. He's done a lot of racing. I mean, he's in the mid forties, and uh, you know, like in two thousand eight, when everything came down, maybe I should have kept going. You know, maybe do my own thing a little bit and try to, and the, and the class like that could be competitive. But you know, there's a lot of risk, I and mean, that's one thing that he did that you can't deny. I mean, he could have got really hurt. You know, as you don't he did. balance he, he did when you get older. Leg. So he did with, with yeah. his leg, right? Yeah. So you know, that's 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 how the, as they say, that's the way the egg roll. And, yeah. and, and at the end of his superbike career, I think he he sent Maladin back home, right? Well, I remember when they made it, you know, all legal and everything, and Larry Pegram came out, and uh, he had a really good system, and Larry won. And he's got, I think, the biggest gap between superbike winners from, I think, the one time in Willow Springs to that time, and, and Larry won. And, uh, yeah, once people got the right, it made it easy. Like I said, when I go out with the new bikes, I know it's only a track day and all that stuff, but man, it it, it is it's it really hard to understand. It's, it's ten, I'd say almost ten percent, a little bit easier than it used to be with the you know the bikes that we ran. Um, it's just that the power is the same, but it delivers it so much better. I mean, remember my knuckles tonight? They wanted to get dislocated when the bike would just hook up so hard. You know, you know, it's kind of hard to tell the mechanic. I, don't, I want less traction, you know, but um, the. Uh, it, 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 it helps quite a bit. And it's not sour grapes because I rode the Kawasaki. It was a great bike. And I rode the Honda. They lent me the bike. And I went out there and I did a bunch of laps. I mean, it's not perfect. You know, some of the little things, you know, the, the computers. But that's just a street bike. And uh, it made track days a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And then, whenever, like I said, when everybody got it, then it reset the whole thing. You know, Matt wasn't dominating anymore. I mean, Larry could win. Josh won. A lot of guys. And then and then he just went, did the usual. Oh, all done. He just left. I remember one thing that was pretty funny about him. He, uh, you know, because I was, the, you know, doing really well, super bike and 600, winning both classes and and all that stuff. So one year he showed up with a Suzuki, 600. He goes, I'm signing up, signed up and everything. And he goes out and he barely cracked, cracked uh, he barely made the top 10. I was looking, barely made the top 10. And then he parked the bike. Then he goes, oh, I'm too big. I'm too big. You know, I can too tall, I'm too big, this is uh, doesn't doesn't work. Well, here comes Mr. Ben Spees. He's, I think he's taller. Gets on the bike, kicks my ass, I, you know, goes out there, we race, we we dice, and I won, he won, but he was like on fire. And then I'm going, hey, what about that guy? You know, and that's why I was happy that Ben showed up and start winning, and you know, to me, a person that's deserving winning at least is, uh, I'm not, well, that's sounding weird, but I mean, Ben, I thought, was a, a, a true master of the craft from motorcycle racing. So I, that was fun for him. Yeah, and he yeah. could win on a 600, too, yeah. which to my detriment. But still, he, he was a good racer, him. And I mean, you look at guys I raced in 600. I raced against Doug Chandler, Scott Russell, Anthony Gobert, Ben Spees, Ben Bostrom, Eric Bostrom, and Aaron Yates. I know I'm going to forget guys, but I mean, some of the top, crop of the guys i mean be, oh, you, you, we won a lot in 600 i'm like yeah against those guys you know it's like i was riding you know some sort of local race weekend and and people were trying to sell those bikes and they were racing in there and everywhere Steve, yeah Eddie. everywhere you went you rested against you raced against uh some of the best racers in history and you beat them 
which makes you one of the best racers in history. Yeah. But you look at looking seriously, just take two seconds and look at the entry grid in 1991 when my first Daytona win. I mean, the world champion was there. I can't remember his name. It was Bell or something. Carl Fogarty was there. I mean, that's back in the days when the top European with the money would come over and try to win. And guys that did the Alamon, they would show up and stuff. And then our guys were there. Everybody would show up, you know. And and that year, I mean, if I didn't have a uh, – if they didn't throw out like five pace cars, I probably would almost – I would have won by almost a minute. Every time I got the 25, 30-second lead, they threw out a pace car. And like anybody else, I'd look around going, okay – What's going on? Did they plane land accidentally in Daytona? Or, I mean, sometimes there might be a crash there. I'm like, okay. But then after that, there was like, come on, man. We had such a big lead. I don't know if you remember, maybe you don't, but my pipe broke and it was making a lot of noise. And we were afraid we were going to get disqualified for having the bike too loud. So we made an extra pit stop, changed the pipe, which is kind of hard to do, a little hot. And the boys put a new pipe on and went out and they still won by a bunch of seconds, you know? So that, that year I was on fire and the bike, we had a good setup and working with Ray Plum too, another magician that's been around racing for entire life. And I mean, having Al, of course, my mechanic and, but Ray back then was involved into the racing. And that was, that was really something that was, uh, that was a, an attribute to, uh, to the team. So it was fun. So we had, we had some good, and we had some good races. How did that 2012 deal come about? I mean, electric. Yeah. Well, let me tell you the whole story about the electric bike. Um, first of all, I'm motocrossing up in Milestone. And there's this really tight corner, and it's a big triple, and then another tight corner. Nobody's doing it. I'm doing it. Because, you know, I love motocross. I love riding. And all my buddy and I, I do this word for word. I go, hey, guys, watch this. I go out, and I got one leg that's shorter than the other. And I, I had a motocross boot where I put a lift on. It was a little too big. But I was you know, making with. So I jump, 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 turn, I come up the tight corner, and whoa, whoa, I get on the throttle, it spins up too much. I try to short shift it so I can rock and just jump and land on the other side, which was no biggie. I did a bunch of time. Well, I went to hit the shifter, got a neutral. Endo, into the third jump, push my left leg through my pelvis, breaking in eight pieces. So I go to the hospital. Doctor says, you're fine. Don't cross your legs. I come to my house. There's a doctor living across the street. I show him the x-ray. He goes, you need an operation tomorrow. And long story short, got the operation done on my leg. And I broke my wrist, cracked the bones. I had my wrist was broken, my, my hip, a little concussion. And the phone rings. He goes, hey, Miguel, this is a lightning motorcycle. We want to go race the Lamont Le Mans for the world championship. You know, can you want to do it? And I'm like, then I was doing the calculation in my mind. I'm like, all right, I'm in a wheelchair right now. I haven't walked in a month because I have to let it heal. I go, I should be able to do this. It's an electric bike. How hard can this be? So I said <laughs> yes. And by the time when I went to sign the contract with him, I had still a little soft cast on my wrist. And I was walking a little funny. And I told him I, I fell mountain biking. A lot more, you know, we life for the greater good motorcycle racer. And and like like it turned out all oh, okay. When I went to France, there was, you know, the grid was sparse but there was an electric bike there and we were the fastest and uh, it was fun we run around and we won so world champion 2012 electric motorcycle Le Mans. it was fun because i ran into all my old friends of the suzuki dominique Millian, the, the the suzuki french guys and a lot of guys and one guy when i came in the pits he's, he's like stopping me to say hi he goes you're going too fast you can't go that fast with that bike i i got close to a 600 time around there you know or something like that and I was just trying to be safe because I was still a bit hurting. And uh, but it was fun to see those guys and won the race. So I'm changing. Right, take my leather suit off in the garage. I changed all this, and the mechanic that was working on the electric bike. When I put my pants back on and everything, he goes, uh, "Miguel, he says, can I ask you about that scar? That that looked pretty fresh." And I'm like, "Uh oh." But we already raced and we won. So I'm like, well, here's what happened. <laughs> and so I told I came clean. I told him that at the victory dinner, I said, yeah, this is what happened. Everything, he's like shaking his hand. I had the x-rays of the eight screws holding my, my pelvis. He's like, all right, well, as long as you won. So that's pretty funny. So what's your wildest memory of your racing days? Hmm. Well, it's all pretty wild, actually. You know, I mean, it's a uh, competition was stiff and was a, it was a gift to win every time I did. And sometimes I didn't win and I still felt I did a great race. You know, I mean, that's, I think that when I look back at racing, well, there was a lot of good fun times when we had a lot of people and 
a lot of people around and uh, racing and you know, the a lot of drunk and all angry. the things and all the big parties and everything. You know, I mean, it was, there was good times. I mean, I, you know, like I said, we I hit it. I hit it right in the sweet spot of uh, racing in America. And hopefully, coming back soon. And um, but I like that. But for me, as a racer, I guess to turn your question is, as long as I felt like I did the most I could do on that motorcycle that day, um, I, I felt you know I felt good. I'm gonna hope usually that led, led to a win or at least being better of a podium. But if I didn't, sometimes I'm like, well, you know. Can't win them all. If you do, you're fixing, you're probably cheating over the top, you know, and <laughs> racing is about pushing the limits. But I'm proud to say that, you know, if if I heard anything about somebody like when I was racing the RZ350, my mechanic, I mean, I had to like crack the whip. I'm like, do not cheat. Don't do this. Don't do that. And like, and he just like, I'm not going to do this and that. I mean, we pulled that thing out of cobwebs to go race the first time to try road racing and see if I'd like it. And one time we got caught and he was using um, plastic boys and Marie's instead of steel. And his story was because he didn't want to mess a piston up when they cracked. And one time he used illegal fuel and I wanted to kill him. I'm like, what are you doing? We're winning. We didn't use this and I won. And now you're using it because you want to win more. I mean, that he was just a tinker. And one time they said to open the, uh, the engine and there was so much mud caked in there that they, they, they had to hit it with a, a two by four and a hammer just to pull the engine out. And even Colin Frazier was there going like, I'm pretty sure this engine's never been open in stock. So we took advantage to make the bike actually better, put a new piston and rings into it. But like I said, I I, I was allergic to that stuff. I either lose with honor or, or, or and win with dignity than, than do anything else than that. How about off track? Any spicy stories of the racers? Yeah, and that's called the vault and you just keep that there. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's, I got some good friends and I got some great stories and, you know, the, the, the funny things that some of them I can tell, uh, there, uh, so when me and Ben, Bostrom and Eric, we we're all good friends, we've always been good friends. We used to go motocross together and Anthony Gobert would be with us. And this is something I did, I think is worth mentioning. Anthony had a bit of a drinking problem. Uh, he would, he would overdo it compared to all of us. And uh, I went like, man, Anthony, you know, just, just keep it on the download during the racing season. Cause you know, he would get trouble and sometimes with pot, whatever. I'm like, man, keep it, stop it for the summer race, do your thing. And then I'm the, nobody cares what you're doing during the winter, you know, just don't, you know, stay out of prison, stay out of jail, stay out of problems. And I always try to help him. And you got to understand when I was trying to help Anthony and holding him by the neck and laughing with him and everything, I'm like, man, I might be shooting myself in the foot. If this guy, you know, if this guy, what he's doing is slowing him down, well, then I'm never going to beat this guy again because he was a hell of a racer. It was hard to beat. And, you know, we had great races. But I thought as a human being, it was more important for me to try to save a human being than, than save my winning position. You know, like I'll figure a way to, to beat him somehow, you know, push harder or something. And then when he did clean up, he had trouble racing, actually. It was kind of a weird thing where he had, you know, and I, I don't know anything about addiction that badly, and but... Uh, he, he definitely has a lot of struggles, and uh, but we try to help him. But we go motocrossing together, and we man, we just rode into each other and everything. It was pretty funny, and and um, Anthony would go out, and we'd be like, "Tomorrow morning, nine a.m., we're going out to motocross at Gorman." All right, and we'd all come in late. Anthony would come in the latest, three a.m., and had trouble using the, I just say the washroom facilities. And, he did a bunch of weird stuff and he would call his girlfriend and he would be yelling and then laughing and everything. And we're like, Andy, shut up for the love of God, you know? So I guess part of that story is, is that, and I'm, I'm sure everybody knew about Anthony's situation. I hope he's doing great today and good. I don't know. I don't want to hear anything, but uh, I did my part. You know, I try to try to help him. And we're all a good bunch of people, you know, we're all good friends and we, we hung out and we had a lot of fun. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's a high pressure profession. This is not a profession yeah. where you can coast. You always have yeah. to show a performance, and that puts a lot of pressure on people. Yeah, that's you know, so, you know, that reminds me when I was sitting on my couch in two thousand nine, and I this is true. I was watching TV, and I, mean, and I was like this, like ready to pounce, I'm waiting for that phone call. I'm gonna go race. We can still do, you know. And I took a breath, and I took an exhale, and I went. And I actually like slowed down, being like, "Okay, it's finished. Let's let's relax." It took me a year to realize that I'm not going to race, and that I could actually exhale and relax, and not—I mean, without knowing it, you're like, 
you know, you're just ready to go all the time. And you just, that's, that's all you are. You're always thinking about the bike. I want to do this, that, that, that. And, um, I got a good story about Colin, by the way, but I'm not going to tell it. But anyway, Colin, <laughs> he's a good oh. friend of mine too. I mean, we had the, actually, there's a good story here. We're playing golf in New Hampshire. Me and his wife and, and Colin, we're all just playing a little golf before the race weekend. And this guy hits a golf ball into us. And I'm like, what the hell was that for? So, you know, um, and then he does it again. So I'm like, well, that that doesn't work, you know? So I, I confront the guy. I say, hey, what's what's your problem? He goes, well, you're driving a car where you're not allowed to drive it, you know? So I'm like, well, you're going to hit me with a golf ball and hurt me because you don't like where I'm driving the golf cart? And then I go and berate him because I want to get in a fight now. I'm like, okay, let's just do this. You know, let's, because I'm really mad about it. And I'm using explosive and everything. But I don't think that's a good language. You're using in front of a lady. And I looked at him and looked at her. And she went like this. And I'm like, oh, I have you. And it, 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 nothing came of it. But it was funny because it was funny. I'm Colin was laughing. He was like, man, you're nuts. And I'm like, well, you know, try to hit a golf ball on me. Come on. You can't do that. Especially when you admit it on purpose. So, you know, like I said, we all hang out. There's the, the guys that you see that you like are, are really good people. You know, they're, they're just they're fun guys to be around. Yeah, they are. The actual interview we did with Colin, we were drinking shots every time he said an explicit. Yeah. So the quality of the interview declined. Around the hour and a half that we talked. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's side you're looking at it. You know, it might have got better, a little bit looser. <laughs> exactly. We yeah, did. You know. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, one time it was when we we're out, out again, Gober, then me and everything. That was it. We're at the Daytona testing. And then we barely made it back to our hotels. It was hilarious. But Colin, Colin had a flight to Australia that that, that morning. We showed up. His dad's looked like, I'm like, look what we found. He's like, oh my God. All right, thanks for it. All right, guys. And we just ran around, and so we we, we did have a lot of fun, and uh, nobody got seriously hurt. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Do, do you want to talk about more contemporary days, Gal, uh, or you want to? I, I have a question. Yeah, I, I I was I was going to ask a bunch of questions on on um the Harley Davidson Superbike in '94, but oh yeah, uh, do we still have time, or are we? Yeah. Okay. Well, we still have time. So real quick. let's get it real quick. All right. The Harley Davidson. Uh, how do you like racing that? You think Harley would ever go back and make another one? Uh, what did they learn from it? Well, I hope so. I think they learned a lot and I'd like to, I'd love to see them try again. That'd be great. They're a great bunch of people. When I signed with them, I had a little bit of instant regret because they couldn't start the motorcycle, but, uh, <laughs> and we had all the problems that we had. There was, you know, but we went from that to, you know, Brainerd, if I had a pit board and I would have known I was pulling away from the guys, I would have probably backed it down just a hair, you know, because I was really on the ragged edge. That's why I rode off the track. But I went from 12th and then I came back up to second place. And I got beaten by two guys you'll never hear from, Tori Corser and Jamie James. And they just, I just did a little slight come out of the chicane and they both stuffed by me. And I was like, oh my God, how lucky is that? And it turned out I did the right thing because I started pushing again to try to catch Colin because I thought he was slowing down too much because he had it in the bag, but turned out he had a transmission problem. So I would thought like, if I can get close enough, I could sneak him and maybe win this thing. You know, I should have probably settled for a second, but you know, who does that? And um, so anyway, that was, that was a great race. Mid-Ohio, the shifter fell off. The bike was actually perfect. Somebody forgot the safety wire to bolt. And I'm leading Pascal Picot, and we're having a great race. I'm riding my, you know, what off. And I thought there was my best chance to win. Not Brainer with the big straight, but the thing I didn't comment on is number one and number two corner, they're such difficult corners, but I could go around there wide open on the Harley, and that would just pass everybody on the outside. They're tracking through there. It was, I almost stayed with them. So there was a part of me that wanted to stay there because the money was pretty close to Honda, but I was like, man, I don't know. Do I, if I signed again and they can't make this bike work on every weekend, I'm really going to, you know. And there was only one class, whereas the Honda was two class. And and it turned out the bike, they did a great job. I mean, Doug Chandler got on it and Pascal Picot, and they all had some good races. I love the chassis of that uh, the bike. I mean, I could break deeper than anything, well, mine because my bike was slow and heavy, but still it, it handled great. I break really deep. I mean, a good story is we can ask Steve Scheibe. He's a good guy, great guy. We motocross together with and everything, hung out. He's a really good guy. Anyway. Um, at Laguna Seca, I did some pretty good laps on that bike, the old bike. The next year, you, people don't understand. You can ask Steve, and he'll tell you. The bike was like 20 pounds lighter and 30 more horsepower. It was like unbelievable what they did in that off-season. 
So at the Laguna Seca, I'm out there riding. And, you know, I said the time, the year before, 94. In 95, I think it was Doug. And he goes around there and laughs. And Doug Chandler is the king of Laguna Seca. He was so hard to beat there. Um, and he comes in the pits and he goes, what time did Miguel do here last year? And he goes, Steve shows him. And, and Doug Chandler goes, man, he really wanted it, didn't he? <laughs> and that's another compliment. That's like the John Kaczynski thing. You know, you hear these things and like, oh, my God. That soul, that's so that's a big compliment to me, you know. Anyway, so that that that's my Harley Davidson story. It was really cool. And and then, you know, the thing that hurts a little bit, you find out some people cheat, like in 600, they use the wrong magnesium wheels instead of using the steel the OEM wheels. And when you find that out, you're like, well, how come nobody at Dunlop spilled the beans, you know? Anyway, but uh, and then you lose a championship. You don't lose just a race, you lose a championship. You're like, okay, but you know, it's not uh it is. It is what it is. Those, those are the little things. The, the, the other thing was was bigger. I think with Suzuki that that was bad for the sport. It was bad for everybody. And but uh, anyway, there you go. All right, MotoGP predictions. Um, I think. Well, I mean, obviously, obviously, Mark's going to be a the big part of it. Uh, if Mark can stop himself from being Mark, as far as like trying to not just win, but destroy everybody by 20 seconds, or maybe if the, he gets a really good setup, if he can just not race against his ghost and just raise the competition and make sure he gets more points than other, I think he's going to win it. Uh, but I think that, uh, that the senior, you know, all those guys over there right now, the, the, the current world champion and uh, Martinez, they're going to put up a great fight. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be some, some serious good racing. Let's see what KTM comes up with too also. And, and Honda, Honda's not laying down. You know, they're stepping up their game. So it'd be ironic if they they, they got a bike working for those guys, and they then they come back and then win. So yeah, I'm just really I watch every one of them. And I love it and uh, looking forward to the new season. Same thing did, with Supercross, which is just down the road. And I know I'm coming up. Did you pick up the phone and say, "Hey Honda, I know what's wrong. Let me help you." Or are you still collaborating no, with I'm them? Not, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna brag too much. No, I'm not going to. But when I was there, the bikes were pretty good. Uh, the 600 bike that they used the the before they had that 600 Honda the the stock bike for the, well that was from our Formula Extreme bike that was developed here in America they did a lot of the, the a lot of the stuff we did here was testing everything racing is testing for something better and so we did that and the super bikes were pretty good at that time and uh, that was a big part of that so you know yeah sure I I think it, maybe I don't know you know it's you only remember the good stuff. That's one thing I learned about 24 hour racing when I did 24 hours and I was the fastest guy and would win and I won some races and man, getting up at 2 a.m. to go, you know, full throttle, freezing rain at Lamar or Spa. You, you start saying to yourself, what am I doing here? You know, but if you take, <laughs> but this is serious. If you take a year or two years off and they say, Miguel, you want to do a 24 hours? Well, yeah. Then you show up at the 24 hour and 2 a.m. rolls around again or 3 a.m. They wake you up from the sound sleep from 20 minutes and you have from the other guy. And you go out in the darkness and we smell the oil everywhere. And I'm like, what am I doing here? So uh, so my point to that story is you always remember the, the, I do you always remember the good the good things. So uh, maybe you know it's it's, well, it's well, fine. you still you still have the fire, obviously talking to you, you still have the fire and, and you have, you have the physical fitness as well, judging by your hundred mile rides that you post yeah. on Instagram. And I was like, is this guy crazy? I mean, you go, you go Red Rock, you go Blue Diamond, you go back Summerlin, and and I was, I was like a hundred miles in like six hours. Come on, that's insane. Yeah, my I did my record this year, one hundred fifty-two miles, nine hours and forty-eight minutes, sitting on the bicycle seat there. That was fun. I figured, what the hell? I want to. I always wanted to do a long one, so did it. <laughs> fun. Uh, okay, I got the last question because we're we're yeah. really running over. Uh, and that's a self-serving question. Uh, what's the best place to eat in Las Vegas? You know, in Summerlin, uh, if you like Italian, North Italia is a really good restaurant. Uh, pasta alla vodka, fantastic. Uh, for steak, Echo and Rig, you got some really good steaks, a nice ambiance there too. Oh my God, we got uh, a reservation for tonight. Yeah, good. And Cetabello's, yeah. which is a chain restaurant, you got the Diallo pizza, but add extra prosciutto on the machine to cut it and to put it on the pizza. Fantastic pizza. Those, those are the spots. And the yard house, of course. Get a half yard beer and have the mac and cheese. It is very good. <laughs> You'll see me there. Have you been to the uh, to Tatori to go see the, the Christmas parade? So, you know, taking the if, family there. If you like oh, Italian yeah. 
Have you been to my mother's house in Sun City? No, I have not. Okay, what happened? Google, Google it. Is it's, that a local it's business? This, it's a local business. It's this guy I think that's I did like that old, there. an old mobster that just stings all those Sinatra songs and and, and tells Sinatra yeah. stories and yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, we we went there. We had dinner there because uh, my girlfriend worked and that seminars there. She work, you know, jump bounce around and does shows and stuff and uh, for for work. And we went there. Yeah, there was a guy singing and everything. It's awesome. It's good stuff. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to be discovered in Vegas. There's more than just gambling and stuff. You know, there's Red Rock, like you said, just cycling, mountain riding, mountain biking is terrific out here too. So that's why I'm here. You know, I came here to save some money from taxes in Canada and fell in love with the place, and I'm still here today. Yeah. Yeah. What was the restaurant you and I went to uh, when we had the track day? We went. We went to Echo and Rig. Okay. That's what I thought. Very good place. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We have reservations for tonight. So if you jump in the car and get here, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Or just drive to Burbank and, and grab a plane, which is faster. <laughs> yeah. Burbank. I lived there for a little while. It was fun. Yeah. There, there's no flights anywhere out of, you, you can't go anywhere without connecting out of Burbank. Yes. I prefer Miami a lot more. You can go everywhere from there, but over here, very difficult. You have to go to LAX. Well, that's the beauty of Vegas. You know, the McCarran Airport, I refuse to go to Harry Reid, but um, and, you know, it's close and you can go anywhere from there, you know? It's pretty fun. Yeah, the, no, Terminal pretty good. 4. Yeah, Terminal 4 is pretty nice. Huh? Terminal 4 is pretty nice. Yep. I'm trying to think of a local. I almost went there today, uh, yesterday. Mark Ritchie. Mark Ritchie is beside the John Cutters on Foothill and Charleston. A little hole in the wall. This New York pasta place. I mean, waitress is definitely from New York and everything, and it's it's great food. And I mean, you can go in there and out and under a hundred bucks, no problem. With four, I mean, it's great food. Mark Ritchie, yeah, Mark Ritchie. Nice. Oh, we'll we'll try it. There you go. They can Annabelle, any more questions? All right. Uh, yeah, World Superbike. So we haven't talked at all about that, and I mean, I mean, Ducati seems to have technically found something, and they're dominating everywhere. But uh, what are you, what are you, what are your predictions for coming year? Man, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be exciting to see uh, Jonathan Ray on the Yamaha, right? So I think it's going to be some fantastic racing. Um, hopefully, he adapts to it. I'm sure he will. He's a, he's a talent, such a a guy, and. Uh, uh, Rogu, whatever his name is, I have trouble pronouncing. I mean, uh, uh, oh, Rasta Kyoglu. Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, I love it. It's good, it's good race, and it's and, and yeah, of course the the, the Ducatis, and uh, I, I, it's going to be very interesting. But I, I, I'm I'm sorry to say, I think the uh, the the I mean, MotoGP obviously is going to be, especially with Mark with doing that big move, and uh, it's going to be very. Uh, it's going to be. I mean, 2024 is promising to be a hell of a year. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't I mean, quite understand. Tomac anything. coming back in Supercross too and Motocross, he liked Tomac. So that's another big story. Again, Jed Lawrence. And uh, yeah, no, it's good time to be a, a couch sportsman watching motorcycle racing. They, they even came up with a ton of new models for 2024, the manufacturers. We we, we did an episode of that where uh, <clears throat> Rennie just broke down like 20, 30 bikes for us. But you know, with between racing and the new models, um, motorcycles are. You know, twenty twenty four is going to be a really good year. Yeah. Well, you know, we're talking. I, I got some stuff more on the side. I'm not sure if I could say it, so I'm not going to say it. But I was talking to a lot of important people, and I said, "Listen, look at all these little razors and electric bike. What I think is good about the electric bike is you see a lot of kids now riding with electric bikes. Well, guess what? When they grow up and get bigger, they're like, hey, why don't I try a real bike? So I, I really see a renaissance coming in for the motorcycle. I mean, there's nothing better for freedom of the mind and the body is to ride a motorcycle. You got to learn how to do it right. You got to learn how to be able to maneuver. You got to know how to look around. There is responsibility to them. The more freedom you have, the more responsibility you need. It's like rock climbing. You got to know what you're doing. If you're not, it's kind of a problem. Big time. So, but I think there's a big renaissance motorcycle coming up. Sales are going to hopefully can be coming back up and, and it's uh, all going to go the right way. And hopefully I can get involved somehow someday into racing again. I'd love to commentate on the races. I'd love to be uh, somebody would have like what Ben Spees put together. They put together around him. If something like that would come along, maybe I'd love to to be part of it. But if I'm not, then I'll just watch it and do like everybody else, critiquing. 
<laughs> you experience you be great but I want to write down this. So just, this was an epic. You said uh, the more responsibility you, the, the more freedom you have, the more responsibility you have. That, yeah. That's a saying for the ages, and and that goes really outside of motorcycling too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I'm a big believer in that, and I want, if possible, if everybody can have the freedoms that we enjoy as kids growing up. I mean, riding bicycle without a helmet, no problem. Jumping, doing this. I used to have a shotgun, and then, you know, my dad showed me how to use it. And I was a little kid. I had to make sure I didn't hit the nose into the dirt. But I had that freedom because I, I, I took the responsibility. How my dad taught it to me, and then never had a problem. Never had a problem with guns. Never had a problem with motorcycles, snowmobiles, and so on and so forth. So, and, and, and like I was saying, is I just want the kids today to be able to have that. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I want them to be educated, you know, and, and then do it, do it right. And enjoy because if you do it, then there's nothing better for the soul. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in Florida, we ride without helmets. It's 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 optional. And yeah, we, I used to do it, and then I I saw the impact and the issues, and I'm like, I was crazy. Put a helmet on, even if you're not required to. Yeah, and that's a choice. That's beautiful. I mean, when I see guys riding without a helmet, the first thing I think is like, how hard is on your ear? I hope you got earplugs in there because the wind noise is crazy. But, <laughs> And I yep. like to ride my little 50 scooter sometimes because you don't have to wear a helmet either. And it's 50 cc under the speed limit. And I, just, I don't use it to go down to the strip, but I'll use it around Summerlin if I go to uh, Mark Ritchie's and, or uh, DeMarco's also and Charles. I mean, the little places are not too far where I can go around and make eye contact with people and and, uh, and get around. Sometimes I'll do that. It's, you know, why not? It's fine. Yeah. You still do track days, road racing? I would if when people call me and they have a bike and whatever, or if I can, you know, they say if we want really want to do this, then like I said, I call Honda and they lend me a motorcycle. They were very gracious with that. And I love that fire blade. I think it was a fire blade. I'm not too sure, but it was, you know, a fantastic handling machine. Uh, did the video with that, and this Kawasaki was the same. I mean, Kawasaki was really, really, very gracious to me too, and they lent me a great 750. And and like I said, that's where I discovered like going, wow, it's a little bit easier doing this with this thing. But at that level, you know, right? Next weekend, I don't know. No, I don't know the. I go to a tr you go to the track day, uh, the track day weekend, and and people will take lap times. I'm like, why are you guys here? Take some lap times. I mean, let's see what's who's doing what. <laughs> it's fun. You can uh, you can get the racer onto a track day, but you can't get the racing out of the track guy. So anyway, you know, that was that was fun. I enjoyed it. No, but it's a good learning tool. I don't know how you. I mean, in business, we measure everything, right? To to be able to make it better. Otherwise, you don't know if it's better. So I don't know how you you apply something new that you've learned on a turn or or, or do something different. Then how do you know if it's better or not unless you're tracking your lap time? Yeah. I'm a big believer in performance. No, exactly. Absolutely. And it's fun. You know, I mean, obviously it can lead to, you know, crashes because you start pushing more. You want to be faster than your friend. I don't have that problem. That's their problem. But uh, I, you know, why not? Like you said, if you do a little bit of modification and I mean, I've. I, there was a friend of mine, Jack Pfeiffer, still a friend of mine. At Daytona, I was watching him ride around in the 90s, early 90s. And I looked at his bike and I was like, man, what the? So I went over to his pit and I jumped on the bike and I dialed the suspension. And he went from like 19th to like fifth fastest. But then he kept coming around like, can you help me with this? And I'm like, dude, no, I got my own work I got to do. I did that. Good luck. You know, keep it going. And he actually finished fourth at the Daytona 200, the year that me, Ben, and Curtis, I think it was uh, us, or was it Nikki? We got an Honda, got the full podium, and Jack Pfeiffer got fourth on his own, like pure privateer. So that was a hell of an accomplishment for him. Unfortunately, it didn't lead to bigger, better things. I mean, he kept racing and he did a lot of winning, you know, on the West Coast. And he's a good guy. But uh, yeah, that one day, like, that, that's my point. I went over there and helped him, and he just dropped like almost a second and a half a lap. So you got you to keep the lap times on. Yeah. I like Absolutely. to help. <laughs> so uh, I, what would be your advice for track riders like in general what to focus on what to get better at you know just the trail brake riding you know try to make your corner speed a little bit better but you know again you got to set up the bike for that don't be afraid to change the bike change the bike if it's bad so what you missed a couple of laps or maybe a session come back change it back have fun with it why not do that and once you hit something that you feel real comfortable, you're going fast and you're happy, then good. Then just keep pushing that. Put new tires on, get the tire warmers, try to maybe a little bit different line, try something. That's why if you do lap times, like you said, you could just try changing your line a little bit, apexing a little later or a little sooner or carrying more speed or braking a little harder and see if you go faster, you know? And uh, I think it's just something that keeps you coming back. And I think that's that's the way to do it. 
Don't be afraid of And if you're of really good, yeah. and if you're really good and really fast, do not race on the streets. Get sign up, get a local license, do a local race, get your license, and have fun because it's just as much fun racing on the weekend that it is doing a track day. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Terrific, Gal. Anything else? No, yeah, I think I think we got it. I think uh, well, you got it, and plus plus plus. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, plus, plus. Well, and we I was, was going to say, hours, but no, nobody has. You, no, you don't have yeah. that one, fortunately. I, I was going to say, I was going to say, um, the the beauty of of today's technology is that everybody can um, go on the internet and say what they want to say, and you obviously have a lot to say. So I suggest maybe you be be more active on YouTube. Maybe start a YouTube I try. channel. Well, I'm, you know, I like to do the podcast, like you guys do, or something like do my own commentating on the MotoGP because there's something sometimes. There's some racing that where I got to just like turn the volume down because it makes me want to have a brain explode, like, you know, scanners in the movie. But, uh, uh, and I think I could do a real good job, bring a lot of different perspective to it, a little bit of color commenting, but we'll see. Hopefully the future is going to be brighter and we can do some stuff like that and just, you know, keep the sport going, keep getting bigger, better. You know, that could be an interesting idea if you broadcasted the race while talking over the comments so mute the comments from the commentators and do your own commentary because i think that would be a lot more fun a lot more interesting and, and, and a lot more well, you can have commentators like the it should be a commentator race the door debate you know you can listen to the tv one and have an, and the earphone on this one and go oh, hey he said this he said that and be kind of yeah. you know you can get a different perspective on it hey i watch tv on my phone and i watch my tv and i'm like we're multitasking here boom 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 <laughs> So, we should try that. That could be a lot of fun. Gal staff yeah. meeting. <laughs> <laughs> After we're done. Okay, staff meeting. Uh, thank you guys for listening. There was oh. another episode of Edge Grip Podcast, episode number 17. Um, yeah. With legendary number 17, uh, Miguel Duhamel or Duhamel. Uh, and just, just call him God. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one lower. <laughs> <laughs>